Welcome everyone. My name is Nimish Patel and I'm the Chief DEI Officer for Aiken Gump. It's my pleasure to moderate today's session with some of the outstanding legal leaders in the legal profession about how top companies embed DEI into their workplaces. We've been talking about DEI in the legal profession for many years. And yes, there has been some change, but it's been incremental. What we'd like to do today is to start with some quick highlights about where we are in the legal profession in terms of diversity based on the soon to be released MCCA Law Firm Diversity Survey Report. This will be a sneak preview in terms of some of the highlights and I strongly encourage everyone to read or review the full report, which will be re released soon. It always has so much information that's incredibly helpful to law firms and corporate law departments. And then the bulk of our time will be in a conversation about how each of our companies approaches DEI and some promising practices to embed DEI into the workplace. First, let's start with that quick overview. Next slide, please. So starting with looking at associate diversity, as you can see from this slide, looking at data from 2010 to 2020, again, there has been some progress looking at associates of color in total. That, that percentage has gone up from 21% in 2010 to about 28% in 2020. And then looking at some of the larger groups more specifically for Asian Americans for at the associate level, that's gone up to about 12.6%. And so a little bit less than 50% of associates of, of color at large firms. And then in terms of black or African American associates, there has been an increase uh, a little bit from 4.5% to 5.3%. And for those of us who have been monitoring this, we know that it took until last year to actually recover from the losses that happened from the financial downturn. So across the profession, still a lot of work for all of us to do. And then based on this information here, you can see that for Latinx associates, they are now the second largest group of associates of color. One other promising piece of information here is when you look at our 2L recruiting efforts, that has now been 36%. So again, some, some important developments in terms of the pipeline that's, that's coming, still more to do. And then in terms of women of color, that has also increased from a little bit less than 12% to 16%. Next slide, let's take a look at how we're doing in terms of partners of color in particular. So again, overall partners of color has increased from just over seven or just under 7% to a little over 11%. So some gains, but still a lot more to do across the board. For Asian American partners, that is now about 4.3%. And for Black or African American partners, that increased from just under 2% to about almost 2.5%. And then for Latinx partners, now just a little over 3%. And also one of the other areas that we're definitely always keeping a track of in terms of women of color, that has gone up a little bit from two, just over 2% 2 to 4.2%. 2, to and so now women of color represent about 38% of all partners of color. Next slide, please. So in addition to just looking at representation, it's also critical, as we all know, in terms of looking at both attrition and promotion rates. And what this chart does is takes a look at all of those different groups in terms of attorneys of color, and the first column has the representation as we just talked about. The second column uh, with the yellow highlights shows the attrition and uh, the yellow highlights indicate that the attrition rates for each of those groups that's highlighted in yellow, essentially every group of attorneys of color is actually higher than the rate of representation. And similarly, in terms of the partner promotions column, the last column, the orange highlights indicate that the rate of partner promotions is actually lower than the representation of associates for all of those groups that have been highlighted. So again, this isn't necessarily surprising to most of us, but it just underscores how much more work, even though there's a lot of good work being done, how much more work we still have to do. Next slide, please. And then in terms of looking at women overall across, uh, across law firms, 
there's definitely some good news and again, some, some continued areas for, for work. So in terms of at the associate level, women are now almost 50%. And that should not be a surprise because I think, again, as, as we all know, women have comprised almost 50% or now a little bit over 50% of law students for easily 20 years. So now across the, the, the law firms, we're looking at getting close to that 50% marker. Among two well summer associates, it's now slightly above 50%, looking closer to about 54%. But again, when we're looking at partners, whether at the equity or at the non-equity level, still a lot of work to be done. And, and again, we're seeing even more representation at the non-equity level. And the, the constant challenge for all of us is how do we convert that into the equity levels as well? And then looking in terms of attrition for women at the associate level, 47%, so just a little bit below the rate of representation, which is again, 48%. But what will be interesting to see is what happens with this year's data at the end of this year. Again, the impact of COVID, uh, what, this will be critical to, to see as we go forward. And then in terms of partner promotions, uh, again, a generally a pretty strong story here, 40, 42% in terms of women at the partner promotions level. Again, the best case, what we should be aspiring towards is having the same level of promotions as the rate of representation at the associate level. So we're not quite there yet, but we need to continue our, our focus on that. Next slide, please. Now taking a quick look at uh, LGBTQ plus individuals and then also individuals with disabilities. Uh, as, as folks on this call probably know, this is uh, October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And so we want to make sure that we included some information there as well. Let's start with taking a look at our LGBTQ plus attorneys. Um, and at the associate level, we're at just a little over 5%. Uh, again, the pipeline continues to look strong. And at the 2L center associate level, it's 8%. Um, so again, some, some meaningful progress there. And it's certainly some of that is also a willingness to identify that perhaps was not there as much before. But again, great to see that, uh, that increase compared to even at the associate levels. And then you see the partner information as well, whether equity or non-equity, right around uh, a little over 2%. Then the, again, the slight bit of good news here is at the attrition level, slightly below the rate of representation. So, so that's good but um, still something to keep an eye on. And then partner promotion still under 3% there as well. And then in terms of individuals with disabilities, I think we generally know that there's a lot of underreporting here across the board, um, but still important to, to keep in mind as part of our overall DNI efforts. Uh, in general, as you can see here, it's pretty much right around 1% uh, across the board in, in all of these metrics. But again, keeping in mind that there is probably a fair amount of underreporting here as well. And next slide, please. I think we might actually be done here. So actually, if we could take the, uh, the slides down and we'll go into, into our discussion. Terrific, thank you. Great to see everyone. So I'd like to, uh, to start off with in our discussion, we have some, again, terrific leaders from across the legal profession. And one thing that we know is that there are a lot of commonalities and also some important nuances in terms of how each of our companies approaches DEI. So what I'd love to do is start off with talking a little bit about each of your company's approach to DEI, the strategy, and also how you've been executing on that. So Jennifer, congratulations, first of all, to you and Abby for being the MCCA Employer of Choice Award winner for this year. So I'll let you kick us, kick us off. Thank you, Nimish. Uh, glad to be here and appreciate the honor for the team. Um, so here at AbbVie, when we look at diversity and inclusion, we started our journey on our current program back in 2017. And we decided that it was as important as any other business imperative. So we really had to have a multifaceted uh, strategy to address it. And so that involved benchmarking, looking at what other companies have done for 35 years prior in areas where they found success or, or didn't. And thank you for sharing that data um, for the audience. I think it's helpful to ground ourselves in there have been, you know, some recent improvements, but this is a long road and a long play. And so much more to do in that area and also on the topic of inclusion. 
So, so with that benchmarking, we came up with a strategy that is both internal and external focused. But before I get into it, I just want to say why, you know, why, why even go here? And so at AbbVie, we're a biopharmaceutical company. We have patients in 175 countries. And fundamentally, as a business principle, we think we'll get better outcomes with diversity of thought, and it's the right thing to do. So with that, our five pillars for legal are focused from recruitment to development and retention, to training and awareness, to pipeline, and then to partnerships. So really the full spectrum, making sure that this multi-legged stool uh, can, can really address the challenge before us. So um, then specifically, one that we talk about a lot is our outside counsel program, which um, was a big part of um, our recognition from MCCA this year. And that program really has three simple goals. The first is as measured by timekeeper hours, we expect an aggregate and goal of equal male and female partner hours on our matters. We wanted to double the amount of minority hours uh, working on empty matters. And then lastly, for all attorneys, not just partners, at least 50% were to be from underrepresented populations in the law historically. So, so that's generally how we're thinking about it internally and externally. And I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. I'm happy to jump in uh, with, with the Airbnb approach. Um, so DEI is really integral to Airbnb's mission, which is to really create a world in which anyone can belong anywhere. And so you can really see how that that uh, fits nicely with a lot of what DEI is about. Um, so the company really tries to integrate DEI in how the business is run, um, as well as the employee experience. And specifically, um, its strategy is really focused on one, uh, partnerships with experts that can really help us bring the benefits of home sharing to more people and to also just make the tech industry more inclusive. Um, so for example, earlier this year, we partnered with uh, 110, which is a coalition focused on closing the opportunity gap for Black talent in America. And this partnership focuses specifically on recruiting, retaining, and advancing Black talent without a four-year degree into really family-sustaining careers and really builds on the company's efforts to expand diverse hiring and our living wage pledge. Um, we also focus on advancing DEI at Airbnb. So uh, we have a diversity, um, diversity and belonging plan for every organization within the company with a lot of focus on transparency and accountability. So each of these plans has to have goals and objectives and we have to ensure that we're executing against and making progress on them. So the legal department is definitely part of that. Um, we also expand, have a very expansive training program to really focus on diversity and bias removal, including really specific training for hiring managers. Um, this year, we specifically focused on reducing bias and practicing allyship in difficult workplace situations. In fact, uh, I spent the majority of yesterday morning going through that allyship training, and I thought it was really effective. Um, and then we're going to be turning to other uh, areas of focus, such as disability inclusion um, soon. And then since 2017, um, we've always required women and underrepresented minorities in the U.S. to be presented in candidate slates when we hire for open roles. Um, and then the company also conducts annual pay equity analysis to really identify and adjust any gaps. So, um, you know, as you can see, Airbnb has a pretty comprehensive approach, but uh, Luckily, you know, working for a company where its mission, business mission is so tied to um, DEI work, in, in some ways it makes it kind of easy, right, to have all of these things integrated into the employee experience and how the business is run. Naris, I think that I'm um, just picking up um, on some of the um, <clears throat> initiatives uh, at Airbnb, um, <clears throat> which are really um, your description and Jennifer's description about holistically addressing it is fabulous, right? And, and in particular, just picking up some of the things that uh, VMware has been doing um, is uh, one, you know, for a number of years now, we've had uh, and also a uh, people can, can agree or disagree on whether, you know, you want to be targeted on numbers, but I work for an engineering company at heart. And so everything is about numbers. Um, and so, um, you know, the executives also uh, put their money where their mouth is, where we have 5% of our bonus 
tied to meeting our DNI um, targets. And so, <clears throat> and whether you know a, a particular team wins, um, you know, is actually in you know is consistent with the goal or not, it's based on the entire company. Um, so uh, it's sort of like that sort of uh, next step. And I do believe, um, Iris, as you said, that having sort of um, a diversity candidate on every slate, right? So that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, for a company now of almost 40,000 uh, employees, but we have strived to be able to um, ensure that um, you know we are having those slates, both for promotions as well as those opportunities for um, for those joining the company. Yeah, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll jump in, I think, and uh, and and finish out uh, the comments that have been made or have been fantastic and and very consistent with what we do at FlowServe. Um, and so I'll just piggyback off of off, off a couple of things that I've I've heard the panelists say. So at FlowServe, we 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 live by our purpose, which is to to provide flow control solutions that make the world better for everyone. And so very similar to what Iris is indicating, our purpose truly, um, in order to be successful, we believe means we have to have not only a diverse employee population, but also one that's equitable and inclusive so that every single associate within our organization across 50 countries can bring their best authentic self to work, whatever that is. Um, and so there's all kinds of initiatives and all kinds of pillars around what that looks like. I'll go into a couple that haven't already been mentioned. We, we, we do provide unconscious bias training for our hiring managers um, in an attempt to make sure that they understand when they are hiring and bringing in that they, they may have differences from the people that are across from them they're, that they're interviewing with and that they may have, and we all have biases that we bring into the workplace and how do we make sure we're solving for those biases so that they don't impact the hiring decisions and as a result, impact our pipeline. Um, as, as Amy mentioned, we're a highly uh, engineer focused organization. Um, and, and, and what we found for our engineers is a development program that, um, that starts people out in college. It's very diverse um, specific. So we try to focus on both women and racial and ethnic diversity across the globe when we're building these programs and they go through a rotational program. And the idea is really to combat this notion of not having the pipeline for progression inside the organization. And so if we've got these development tools in place and we're very you know, concentrated effort on making sure they have the right skills, the right capabilities and the right exposure um, across the organization, we find that, that those people can be more successful as they progress through the organization. And then the last one that I'll mention that I'm actually very, very proud of is we've instituted what we call Listen to Lead, which is a, you know, we believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion has to start at the top and our leaders have to set the example. And so when we talk about DEI, our CEO is always the one that is, is, is focusing on this message so that our business leaders understand this is not an HR led initiative. It's not a functional led initiative. It's an initiative from the top and it's a business imperative. Um, and so our leaders now spend time with diverse associates, actually just being empathetic, hearing what they have to say, hearing what their experiences are. And we try to use those dialogues and conversations to inform how we think about future initiatives for DEI. It's really terrific to hear across the board. And, and as we were saying at the onset, there's, there's some nice commonalities that you can see across different companies. And also interesting to see how each company takes things just a little bit differently as well. And just to kind of add in for Aiken Gump, we've, as, as with all of your companies, had a long standing commitment to these issues. Uh, and then over the last several years, we actually developed a much more comprehensive strategic approach to DEI. So we have four goal areas. Um, so the first one is on leadership, commitment, and engagement, because as you were just saying, uh, Lanisha, it, it starts with leadership. Um, so that's our first uh, area of focus. And then we also have one on recruiting and the diversity pipeline. So that's looking at recruiting at all levels, whether we're talking about summer associates or, or laterals, including lateral partners. And then we're also doing some work in terms of how are we supporting the, the, the pipeline for diverse attorneys as well. Uh, and then our third goal area is on professional development and inclusion, which as you can imagine, is just massive. It's the entire work experience of someone when they officially join the firm. And it absolutely includes some of the things that we heard here, such as a focus on implicit bias in terms of evaluations, work assignments, all of those things. And right now we actually have an initiative going on in terms of inclusive leadership. So we're trying to get leaders in particular to think about the, not just how the unconscious part of our brain works, but things that they can actively and intentionally do 
to include people from their teams. And then our last uh, area is on strategic partnerships, which absolutely includes all of our clients, pro bono work and strategic partners like MCCA as well. So this was really terrific to, to, to hear. And one of the things that I'd love to pick up on is what some of you already mentioned in your introductory comments. And that's really focusing on metrics to drive accountability and, and to drive results. Um, such an important part. And, and, and uh, Jennifer, you mentioned you started with that. Amy, you mentioned that I was a huge part of what you're also focused on. Just, and I know across the board, that's, that's a critical area. So Amy, uh, since you started with talking about some of the specific metrics, I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit more about uh, the way that your firm is, your company is approaching uh, metrics specifically in DEI. When we look <clears throat> at, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> for more metrics, so I gave you the top one in relationship to sort of putting your uh, money where your mouth is in relationship to the senior leadership uh, team and uh, and whether they meet um, uh, the criteria for, for being able to get a bonus. But what we really do is sort of like <clears throat> for each individual sort of organization is really being able to track it. Like, for example, you know, it's nice when you look at it sort of in your spare time, but we're very disciplined in being able to say that on each month on my calendar, we have the team just really being able to, from HR, uh, being able to look at um, the numbers, right? So let's look at, you know, how many people we've hired. Uh, let's look at um, how many people have, you know, voluntarily left the organization, you know, looking at sort of promotional opportunities, et cetera. And so, uh, and it's amazing because some, some quarters you think, or some months you did, you think you did so much better than you did uh, when you were actually sort of being measured because, you know, if you have, we have a team of 200, but, you know, if you have um, <clears throat> a few folks, you know, come or leave, or depending on when they've come and left, you know, the numbers can, can be uh, dramatically uh, different. But what I think is phenomenal about sort of um, being sort of metrics dr driven is you can holistically think you're doing a fine job with a lot of the education, the training programs, the, um, you know, having people um, on, the, on the same slate, like we do a great, and I love my uh, reverse mentor. We do a lot of that reverse mentorship um, kind of programs. And you can think, oh, we're doing better. Uh, then you look at those metrics and you realize, well, we have a long way to go. So I think it's a really great um, sort of discipline that on that, you know, and you could do it monthly, quarterly, however you, you seek to do it, but being able to say that you're not thinking, you know, you're doing a really fine job and then the numbers are really telling you something else. I'll just add to that. So I'm a securities attorney at heart. So I feel like transparency is always, you know, the key to influence behaviors. And to Amy's point, I think you just hold yourself accountable when you, you know, have a paper in front of you that shows you what the data looks like. And I think it's important to dig into. So for example, you know, you might have, uh, you know, overall what your department looks like, but you know, if you dig deeper, what does this past year look like? What does retention and promotion look like? And to embed those into those annual or biannual reviews really adds a lot of value. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, you could feel like, like, you know, like Amy, like, uh, I thought we were doing really well, you know, and, and I have used the word, you know, it's, it's a big ocean, but let's, you know, let's see what progress we've made this year. And uh, that can be heartening as well. Yeah, yeah, I would just add on top of that, um, you know, the idea of transparency, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think the accountability piece, so at Airbnb, we definitely publish metrics internally. There's an, a dashboard that gets shared internally every year where you can really see granular breakdowns of, you know, how many uh, Hispanic or Latino employees we have. And they have those stats for leadership as well as the technical teams. Um, but what's interesting is we also have, uh, set a very public goal that by 2025, 20% 20 of the U.S. employees will identify as underrepresented minorities at every level, um, and that, you know, 50% of our global employees uh, who identify in the gender binary will be women. So having those very public goals with a deadline also imparts a sense of urgency, I think, on the company to, to do, um, do the work to get there. And so I think that's another way in which, you know, metrics are, are really um, a, a very good way of sort of driving a lot of this DEI, DEI work for the company. 
Yeah, and, and I'll just say, I mean, you know, to, to echo what everyone has said, one of the things that I've, I've found just being in a corporate setting is that, and, and we, I think this all resonates with all of us, is what, what gets measured gets done, right? And so business leaders are trained to solve for what they are getting measured for. And so no matter where your company is or your law firm, frankly, is in the DEI journey, it, you know, the, the importance of measuring. And look, you may not get it right all the time. As Amy said, you may believe you're doing better, but, but the data is the data, right? And the way we're gonna make progress, I think not only as a profession, but frankly, just generally, is by continuing to push ourselves towards metrics and tr- towards transparency around what is our data from a DEI perspective. I love hearing all of this discussion about the metrics because I, I really think that's such a fundamental part of our work and it drives accountability, it drives results, and it can also empower people as well. I'm going to share with you a couple of our, our things that we're doing in this area as well. Before I do that, for everyone who's listening in, uh, to receive CLE credit for joining this session, I just want to let you know that the poll is now open for you to get credit for joining the session. So you've got about two minutes to do that. So please make sure you do that as well. So on the question of metrics, um, as I was just mentioning, that's a huge part of uh, what I believe in, in terms of how we can measure progress and also hold people accountable, hold ourselves accountable. Um, So we do a lot of benchmarking, as you've said, and again, the, the MCCA report that's coming out soon is a terrific resource in terms of looking at data and getting a sense for where you are as a firm or where some of the firms that you're using are in terms of their their key metrics. Uh, But we also look at key trends and we also look at it from a whole lot of different directions. So whether we're looking firm-wide or by offices, by practice groups, by looking at, of course, different groups, it really gives you an idea of where the strengths are, where the challenges are, where we might be able to allocate additional resources. And quite honestly, every now and then there's some blind spots, areas that we thought we were doing better than we were. So love to hear all of that. Thank you all for for sharing. One other um, really critical area, especially right now, when you think about DEI, we've been talking, as I mentioned at the onset, we've been talking about this for many, many years, 20 years uh, across the profession. And yes, as we as we noted from the the metrics, there's been some progress. It's, It's been incremental, but some progress. One of the things that certainly happened over the last year with the murder of George Floyd is that there was a huge amount of focus on DEI and racial justice more more broadly. So I'd love to hear from just a couple of you in terms of, you know, how how did that impact your respective companies in terms of embedding DEI further into the workplace? And then also, you know, as from your vantage point, what are you seeing across the profession uh, on this issue and, and is it sustainable? So, um, Iris, why don't we, we start with you on that one? Sure. Um, thanks. I So I joined Airbnb after the George Floyd um, trial, but I've been there during you know the rise of um, Asian hate. So my experience with the company is really based on that. And I think you know what I noticed is that it's a company that's very conscious about the impact that these important events um, and societal issues have on the employees and and the larger sort of community of stakeholders that the company has. And so, you know, one thing is executive leadership definitely communicates openly about the company's response, uh, which oftentimes does involve um, a commitment to work with and support other partners who are really on the front lines of a lot of these issues. So, uh, for example, in June 2020, um, we introduced something called Project Lighthouse, uh, which was an initiative to kind of uncover, measure, and really help overcome discrimination when booking or hosting on Airbnb. Um, and really partnering with uh, organizations like Color of Change and civil rights groups uh, and privacy rights organizations in that work. Um, And we plan to share the results of that study um, at some point. And then there's also just a lot of support for the ERG groups um, in the company and and the efforts that they make and the programming. Uh, It's a very active community and it it is definitely well supported. Um, And then I think, you know, lastly, this is kind of the, the thing that matters day to day is just making space for employees to really talk about how these things impact them and um, give them the you know, mental break from the work to actually talk about these things. I think it's especially important now that we're all remote working, right? To make that space for, for people to talk about these things. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, a lot of the work around um, racial justice and, and diversity at Airbnb has been happening even before some of these um, unfortunate events. And so I think, again, it's because the business mission is so tied to DEI that it, it has to have a sustained focus on these issues. And I think that's, you know, phenomenal. <clears throat> you know, work that is sort of sustained. I, if uh, if you'll indulge me, Nimish, I, I wanted to just give sort of like a personal um, um, story. So uh, I had a, an all hands call um, after um, George Floyd's um, murder. And I had written up this incredible, what I thought was incredible since I wrote it, you know, just a very long, you know, introductory um, uh, sort of remarks um, to my team. And, you know, I sat back right before it and I was like, you know, I think that's, that this that I may not be, you know, as, um, uh, you know, what do I know about being a black woman or a black man? I'm not, right? And so I took this, you know, I had quotes. I had, you know, sort of, I felt very passionate about the subject, but I took it, I ripped it up um, and really um, spent the time with the team really talking about the fact that, you know, I don't sit, um, you know, in their shoes, right? And so for our folks, um, for the, um, not just um, uh, our black employees, but our employees of color across the board or uh, LGBTQ, I don't know what it's like. And so what I agreed to do is do really do a listening, you know, um, tour. So I spent a lot of time with our folks uh, on the team, both on the team, but also in the company to be able to understand sort of, instead of me trying to tell you, you know, um, what we can do or what we should do is really listening and understand what would really matter, what would really sort of move the needle um, here um, at VMware to be able to really, um, uh, not just on racial justice issues, but more broadly. Uh, and it was a phenomenal experience with lots of people, like Iris, like you said, half the battle is giving people that opportunity to have those maybe with awkward or uh, uncomfortable conversations, but it really drew out some phenomenal suggestions and ideas that we continue to work on. Wow, that's amazing. Thanks for, for sharing that. And it's those moments where you can get some of those ideas and, and just build that sense of community as well. Terrific. Well. Um, you know, I um, also, one of the, the really terrific opportunities that we have when we've got such a terrific panel together is the opportunity to share some really terrific promising practices that again are happening across different companies. So I'd love to, um, to ask each of you to, to maybe list, and you mentioned a couple of these in the introductory comments, but if you had say three very promising practices that either your company is implementing, or maybe you've heard from some of your law firms as well, but any three promising practices that you would suggest or recommend to others. And as I say that, um, we've had a couple of questions come in from the chat that have specifically asked as a follow-up to some of the comments that you've already made in terms of doing um, either setting aside bonuses for meeting certain goals. Um, so if you could incorporate that into your comments as well, I think that would be terrific. Um, Lanisha, do you wanna kick us off on this one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I mean, as as I'm sure um, the the other panelists will agree, I'm 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 quite proud of my my legal department, uh, and so I have to take the moment to brag on some of the things that that we're doing internally. Um, we started a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee within our legal department specifically, and so while Flowser does a lot of great things at the corporate level. Um, and I think maybe Jennifer mentioned this as well. We also believe that there's opportunities for us, not only within uh, with, as members of FlowServe, but also to support what's happening in the legal profession and trying to drive initiatives there. And so we've created this DEI committee. They meet with me on a quarterly basis, um, and they bring ideas forward of what we should be doing as a department. I'm very pleased that. 50% of our organization is diverse, either um, gender diversity or racial and ethnic diversity. And so we're just tremendously proud of the work that our team has done around recruiting and retaining diverse um, lawyers and, and professionals within the legal department. Um, but last year, we, we, we really spent some time around, you know, we're not really seeing the progress that, that, that we want to be seeing in the legal profession more generally. And so, um, Nimesh, you, you, you mentioned a lot of these you know, it's, it's, there's change, there's improvement, um, but it's incremental. Um, and we know there's a lot of opportunity. And so we started embedding in our performance management 
process with our law firms, DE&I. And that was a new step for us. That was something that was new. And I know there's lots of um, legal departments out there that have been doing this for a few years. So they're certainly, you know, further along in the journey. And we're trying to learn from that. Um, but the feedback that we got from our law firms actually was quite surprising. The feedback we got was, thank you for doing this, because the more clients of ours that continue to say to our management teams, this is important to our clients, this is important to how we generate revenue, the more focused law firms will start to have on it. And it's not that it's not important to law firms, because I do believe there's maybe a little bit of a misconception that law firms just don't care or law firms, you know, can't seem to figure this out. But just like you know, companies, they're on a journey as well. Um, and they're, they're trying to make improvements. And we need law firms to make these improvements because that's really how we make significant progress in the legal profession. So we started embedding that and just got tremendous uh, feedback uh, from, our, from our law firms. And then the other thing we did was we started instituting DEI awards. Uh, and so it was just, you know, a small thing, but, you know, we, you know, our firms that either did the best job of putting diverse um, or women lawyers on our matters or, you know, just showing some effort from the de &I. it's, you know, not anything you can measure, it's not quantitative, but it sends the message that it's not only just the stick, right, which is we're going to ding you on your performance, but also kind of the carrot of thank you so much for showing leadership in this space. And again, it was, it was very well received. Yeah, Lanisha, I love that last one um, too about the awards. I think that that's like phenomenal. You may have to steal it. So uh, yeah. <laughs> please do. And um, you know, I would say that um, you know, I'm I'm sort of totally with you about bragging about my team. Um, we were quite a diverse group uh, well before I um, joined VMware four years ago. Um, but I have to tell you, um, and I'll go through a couple of uh, you know different thoughts. Um, or practices for people to consider, but I would say the number one um, practice that is phenomenal is location and flexibility, right? So when we decided, and it was a, a little bit before the pandemic, but now obviously we're, we're a bit more uh, open to it, is we used to hire just around our sites. Um, and so even if you had a bit more flexible work schedule, you know, there were only certain places we were really looking for lawyers and, you know, employees just generally, right? We then got to the point where we could be able to sort of expose that opportunity across, you know, you know, at least as it relates to the United States right now, across the US. So the ability for us to be more diverse and get sort of different thoughts and um, really, you know, phenomenal candidates um, when you just open the aperture of the location is, you know, you know, I've seen so much progress. And when you, you know, when I tell my team this is our opportunity to be able to look more broadly, they just sort of ate it up. So um, that one change um, allowed us to be, you know, far more diverse by magnitudes than, um, than it would have been otherwise. The other um, couple of things um, I would just add is um, in a sort of part of two of the, part of the same, uh, side, you know, different sides of the same coin is um, I interview um, almost every single person that we, um, we, we are thinking about hiring, right? Period, for the whole legal team, right? Now, most of the time, it's just one left. So, you know, they, the team really wants to hire them and I'm the last sort of conversation. But what's really important is to be able to address the issues that we're talking about today uh, and how we feel about that sort of to the people who are thinking about coming to work for us. Um, but also we've had people who leave us and whether they're, you know, uh, straight white men, or they, you know, diverse candidates of being able to talk to them, of, you know, when they've said that they want to move on. And what's so important to me is what when they want to move on, what lessons have we learned? Um, are they running away from us? Or are they running to something else? So you really get that opportunity both um, when you're um, hiring on um, can, um, diverse talent that they know that there's a home that we care about the subject, um, but even when you're hiring non-diverse talent that we care about the subject. Right, and they won't, and we want them to be part of, you know, our journey. So those are the couple of things that I would just suggest that that we've used that I think could be that at least we found helpful. Yeah, picking up on on that hiring process, um, that's actually one of the things I was going to highlight. So we actually require diversity and belonging questions in the interview process. Um, it is there's a field for it in our uh, sort of intake uh, interview process intake forms, um, and I think it's because 
DEI work is just so important uh, to the team and it's in everything that we do that I think it's important to make sure the people you're bringing into the organization, A, understand that, kind of echoing Amy's point, um, and that you know they're naturally inclusive in how they work with others and that they're passionate about um, DEI initiatives because it's something that, again, we expect everybody to pitch in. So you want people who are genuinely interested in, in helping us make progress in that area. Um, I think another thing that I was going to highlight is we have a formal mentorship program within the department. All senior leadership are required to participate as mentors, and there's a small group of people that do a lot of the matching, and it's very intentional. And I, I highlight it because I do think that it gives um, team members access to leaders within the department that they might not naturally get exposed to as a result of their work. And I think when you provide that um, that connection, it can lead to things like career growth opportunities, because they might be talking about something that the individual wants to do. And, you know, that particular leader might have access to that type of work or um, say, hey, I know about this, this speaking opportunity that you might be a good uh, fit for, or, or eventually maybe even sponsorship, because these are the people who sit in the room and make decisions about promotion. So I think that um, mentorship program will be really effective for that. Uh, but, you know, I think the uh, I think you'd mentioned the 5% um, of the bonus being tied to advancing DEI, you know, the incentives that you the behavior that you're incenting um, is really important. And I think the last thing I would say is, um, you know, it's still a work in progress for us here, the legal team at Airbnb, but we're, we're actively thinking about you know, what are our expectations for how DEI work should factor into performance assessments? I don't think we've landed on a position yet, but, um, you know, should it be considered core responsibility? Is it considered extra credit? Do they get additional recognition when they do it? Um, and I think it's important because if you want to incentivize high engagement and, and regular participation in DEI work, like you have to figure that out. Um, so that would be kind of the, the question that we're pondering right now. And I hope we find an answer soon. I'll, I'll add adding that. that as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and I can add to that. I, I hope what people are seeing as a theme here is really to eliminate unconscious bias. There's a process. And what we have all, all these companies have done is embed that into how they operate. And that's really, for me, the number one game changer. And then, you know, there's variations below that. But um, in, in terms of process, one thing that we adopted similar, uh, but yet a little different from what others have mentioned is the MCCA ABA bias interrupter, which is where that whole process, you know, mindset comes from. And so to the extent that we're hiring someone who is uh, not diverse, we are, mandatorily meeting with managers to understand real qualifications. He, she is a fit is, is not, a, you know, a substantive qualification. And also, you know, being majority female uh, as a legal department and also more than 35% underrepresented minorities, I have a lot of folks, many who are interested in getting involved personally. And so being able to harness that, we now have one in four people in our legal department that is actively working on one of these work streams that's driving strategy for the company. So that that took, you know, a spark and really turned it into a much larger positive momentum. And to the compensation point uh, at AbbVie, when our compensation is analyzed, it's on two factors. One is how you achieved against your goals, but the other of equal weighting is how you did it. So we call that the ways we work. And, and on that leadership dimension, among many other things, is leading inclusively, building strong, you know, high-performing teams. And I love Amy's point about, you know, the globalization of jobs right now and competitiveness. And we all have to be exceptionally strong leaders to recruit from that global talent pool. And so I would say that those would be our top three. And I just love the themes going on here. Lots of commonality. I completely agree. Really interesting to see the commonalities and, and again, how every company is, is approaching this. Um, and just to pick up on a couple of the things that you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> that all of you mentioned. Number one, I, I think being the Soho Law Firm representative here, um, I think you're absolutely right, Manisha, when you say that law firms are definitely focused on this. We're not just waiting back for clients to ask us how we're doing. There's a lot of really fantastic work being done. 
it's, it's not easy, obviously. And so that's why the focus and the attention from clients absolutely helps. It makes a huge difference for, to support our efforts. And, and I like both ways of doing it. You know, some part of it is the accountability, tell us how our matters are being staffed. But I also love the idea of having awards and recognitions, having been on the side where the firm has received some of these awards and recognitions, I can tell you, it makes a huge difference. Um, it just ignites the, the, the relationship partner and the team that's working on the matters and other folks who are also hearing about it goes straight up all the way through leadership. It's really meaningful. I know it's, it's, a, it's a big time commitment on the part of corporate law departments, but it is definitely meaningful. So um, definitely agree with all of those concepts as well. And just a, a couple of examples of some things that we're doing here that also have been really impactful from our perspective. We've, as, as many firms and companies, have, we've had a longstanding uh, DEI council. One thing that we did over the last year is we completely restructured it. So now our chair, Kim Cooper-Smith, actually chairs our DEI council, and of course I help her with it. And in terms of the representation, instead of what used to be just kind of people from different offices talking about what's happening in each office, we've now restructured it. So now we have at least three members from the management committee, three practice group leaders, the partners in charge of our three largest offices, and then also some resource group leaders and office DEI council leaders. So it's a nice mix of people with a lot of influence within the firm and also people who have a lot of experience in the area to help really drive our commitment and show that level of senior level engagement. And then just a couple of things like uh, that, that some of you mentioned, um, love the idea and we're doing some of that as well, about how to embed that into the, the whole leadership experience and, and the process. So we, we've certainly broken out the question about commitment and support. How have you demonstrated that? to DEI for all of our partners when we do our partner review process. We also have implemented that same question for our partner admissions committee. So now everyone who's going up, we want them to talk a little bit about how they have supported the firm's DEI efforts. And the chair of the firm, when, we're, when she's meeting with lateral partner candidates, will also ask the same question. She'll talk about our commitment to DEI and ask them about how they have contributed uh, throughout their careers in that area. So, I completely agree. This is a very comprehensive approach and leadership absolutely matters. So love hearing all of that. Um, so now as, as we're talking about embedding DEI um, in our respective workplaces, one thing that we also know is that all of this work cannot just rest on the shoulders of our women and, and attorneys of color and, and others who identify as diverse in some way. So I'd love to ask a couple of you to talk a little bit about how have you gotten more people involved in supporting the DEI efforts at your company? Um, and, and specifically, how do you get more white men involved in the process as well? So Amy, why don't we start with you on this one? Sure. Um, you know, <clears throat> we have, um, you know, much like Jennifer, um, our, um, in the legal department, then I can more broadly talk about the company, we're about 50-50 uh, men and women. You know, that's why I was saying, you know, on that uh, monthly basis, sometimes we're a little bit more men, sometimes we're a little bit more women, but we're close uh, uh, being sort of 50, uh, almost 50, 50. And um, <clears throat> I can't tell you um, how um, it is so easy with people who really care, right? Um, so when you have a team of, of folks and, and, you know, forgive me for, you know, sort of bragging about them is that all you have to do is sort of provide a little bit of a mirror, right? Um, because they care about the subject um, and they really want to be able to work in a diverse environment and have really seen some, you know, all of those benefits. So what I mean by that is, is that with those, be, <clears throat> being able to just turn that mirror on and being able to say, here are some more opportunities, right? In relationship to like what I said about not hiring your, um, you know, offices, right, of being able to um, give them different sort of tools and, and thoughts about how do you create that diverse uh, slate, right? Um, are we, you know, are we interviewing sort of the best and the brightest, and then they don't look like us, right? I mean, and so let's look a little bit more about who's interviewing the folks, right? So they understand sort of our overall commitment as well, right? So um, to me, um, you know, the best tool is, is that um, when you have really interested uh, white men, 
they are incredible advocates. So I would tell you that on my team, I would tell you from a pure diversity perspective, you know, or from, you know, if you want to say more from um, uh, lawyers of uh, and uh, members of the team of color, um, you probably have more from our uh, leading from our uh, white men uh, on the team that report to me. Um, so part of it is just, uh, you know, being able to sort of have seen that incredible opportunity to have those diverse discussions and that value, then being able to just give them a few more tools, right? Um, you could just, it's just, like I said, amazing how people could be much more intentional. See, part of it is, is that they're not, not trying to just hire white men in the past, for example. But when you put that right focus and provide the tools, you've empowered them to be able to really pay attention, right? And, and really focus on who we're interviewing, who, would, um, who really can uh, bring the very best to bear uh, to join the VMware team. I'll add on to that. So I think if you're doing a good job in, in this space, you're at a point where everyone feels like they are appreciated and valued. And I agree, I have sat in on reviews with law firms with uh, one of my uh, white male peers and I have left with tingles on my arms, just so inspired by his passion around diversity. And so, you know, I think once you have the tone at the top and you're giving them tools that can easily be employed and everyone sees that this is fair and right and, you know, has a place for everyone to be appreciated, then I think it's very easy to get inspired and for many folks to get involved. Like I said, we now have one in four participating actively. I love hearing all of that. And, um, you know, I, I, I've had the, the same type of experience. Uh, there's a, a member of our management committee. He and I were actually on a client pitch together and, and I had joined because the client was very interested in, in these issues. And so we wanted to talk about them. And he's a member of our firm wide DEI council. And I remember one of the things that he, he mentioned as he was talking about his, his role on that council. And he said, you know, I've been at the firm for something like 20 years and this has been one of the most meaningful things that I've been a part of. Um, and you could see that this was really coming from a place that was genuine. And he has just done an amazing job of championing and, and being a sponsor for so many folks within his practice group. So I think you're absolutely right. When, when we can give people the tools so that they know what to do and they're absolutely willing to do it. And one of the things I always tell people is this is part of your legacy um, as, as, as a partner and especially as a senior partner in the firm you can change not only, have an impact, not only the, the amazing client work that you're doing, but in terms of the lives of some of our, our, our attorneys as well. So loved hearing all of that. Thank you. Um, as we're getting close to the end of our, our time, wanted to end with just a, a quick question for all of you. So, you know, we started off by looking at some of the, uh, the, the data within, within the profession. And again, we've made some progress, still lots to do. So if you could do a little visioning exercise, look ahead about five years into the future, what are one or two things that you would really like to see different five years from now? And uh, Jennifer, why don't we have you start us off on that one? Sounds good. So I, I guess I've been saying for the past few years, I would love to see more operationalized tools that we could have chosen instead of building some of ours from scratch. So I feel like that would leverage scale around the industry. So we did use the AVA 113 survey, which was helpful, um, but to see results, you know, or not have to calculate them ourselves and th that sort of thing over time, I think could be very helpful for a long-term scale. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go. Um, there, there's so many things. And so it's, it's almost hard to, to, to settle on one, but I'll say, I mean, and we've talked about this before, but just seeing progress in the numbers, right? Seeing progress in our profession where we've got a, a critical mass of diverse lawyers at every step in the process and seeing those, seeing that progression into, you know, the management committee, the managing partners, the general counsels, that's for me what success looks like. And it's not just kind of 2% to 4%, but it's a real 
meaningful increase uh, in our profession because I fundamentally believe that if we can build diversity at all levels in the legal profession, you end up getting better results for companies and clients and law firms. So uh, it, it, it may not be, it's sort of pie in the sky, but it is truly what, what for me success looks like. Iris or Amy, you want to do a lightning round? <laughs> I think we're, uh, the, I'm seeing the clock. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we, could, we could end it there just because I know that there's a very full agenda and we want to make sure that people get onto uh, to the next session as well. I want to thank all of our panelists. This was amazing just to hear from all of you and about your respective companies. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining this panel as well or this session as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.